All right, all right. Welcome back to Rock Doc's Reading Room, where I'm serializing my book, Rock Doc. All right. Last week, we left off uh, Mari Soul, <laughs> Puerto Rican Pop Festival. And today, I'm going to tell you uh, a story about uh, why it's probably not a good idea to hire your friends as road crew. And we're going to go back on the road for a minute with both Edgar and with uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer. All right, so let's see, uh, let's see how we're going to do. All right, so uh, working for Emerson Lake and Palmer and living in London took some getting used to. London was like New York, but on Valium, slower and more civilized. I drank tea, not coffee, ate fish and chips instead of burgers, and most difficult at all, drove on the wrong side of the road. Greg Lake offered me a room in his townhouse. He lived there with his girlfriend, Anita, and their two Irish setters, Oliver and Cromwell. The house was beautiful, and they made me feel right at home. I think I've told you about that before. A few months after I arrived, I fell very ill. It turned out I had to be hospitalized and I needed a minor operation. Craig was amazing. It was as if he was the brother I never had. I think I've said that too. Although I had a sister, Robin, who I was close with when we were children, in recent years, we had gone in opposite directions, and we now had very little contact. Greg got me the best doctors and a bed in the prestigious Holly Street Clinic. After the procedure, I didn't want to put him out, but Greg would have no part of it. He insisted I return to his home to recuperate. Fortunately, I recovered fully, got my own place, and was able to quickly get back to work. Our office was at 16 Curzon Street, right off of Hyde Park, actually down the block from the Playboy Club. It was, it was kind of a cool area. Um, I spent my days planning our next European tour. There were hotels to book, promoters to call, and meetings with Stuart and the band. At night, I would often go to the Speakeasy, London's version of Max's. The Speakeasy was a great club. And it was the place from about the mid-60s to the late 70s, I think, that everybody who was anybody in the music business uh, would hang out there at night. And whereas Max is, you know, in America, it's such a large country that you have East Coast hangs and West Coast hangs. But in London, London was London. <laughs> and so, you know, most everybody in the English music scene uh, at one point, point or other, would end up at Max's at night. And it was a restaurant, it was a bar, a club, um, and they had great entertainment. I remember uh, one of the first times I went, I think the average white band was the house band there. <laughs> and even famous groups played. I mean, Hendrix famously did a set or two at the Speak. I think the Stones did a set or two at the Speak. And you would always see people hanging out uh, till late, till the wee hours of the morning. It, it was really a cool place, and it became my hang while I lived in London, and it was great. Uh, okay, there was a real contrast between my time on the road and in the office, but as hard as touring was, after a few weeks at home, I couldn't wait to get back out there. The touring lifestyle was unique, and something, for better or worse, that I tried to share with my friends. <laughs> When I was just starting out and Steve Paul told me I needed a road crew for Edgar Winter's White Trash, the only people I really considered were my friends from college, mainly because I wanted to have my friends on the road with me, but also because I, I didn't know who else to hire and I didn't really understand what being in a road crew meant. <laughs> I found out pretty quickly though, I'll tell you. Um, Paul Hoffman and Ashley Lewis, uh, oh wait, uh, the only people I really consider my friends from college, Paul Hoffman and Ashley Lewis. I probably should have looked for more experienced people, but fortunately, Paul and Ashley worked out pretty well. The next two friends I tapped, not so much. Paul Schweitzer and I had been close through grade school, high school, and college. Paul was a guitar player, and we had played in many bands together throughout the years. Although he never asked me, I knew Paul wanted to come out on the road. Greg Lake needed a guitar roadie, someone to string and tune his many guitars every night. I thought the gig would be perfect for Paul. He was excited when he arrived, but that didn't last long. After only a week, I could see that he was struggling. 
I'll never forget what he looked like before the show in Jacksonville. He was sitting on the floor of the stage, surrounded by five or six guitars, all in a state of being half strung, with guitar strings new and used everywhere. He looked like he hadn't slept since the tour started. I put my hand on his shoulder and said, Hey, Paul, have you had enough? <laughs> he looked at me with a blank stare and nodded his head. I sent him home later that night. He had a big smile on his face and a sack filled with 10 pounds of beautiful Florida oranges. Although the job didn't work out, I felt good that I had given him the opportunity. At least he had a story for his grandkids. <laughs> Paul and I were really, really close, and I, I was glad that I could at least give him the opportunity. Um, we played in many bands together during high school and college. I'll tell you a funny story about Paul. So, you know, he lived in the five towns close to me. And when we were kids, one of the places that we wanted to play uh, was a place called the Action House. Um, it was in Island Park, not too far away. And it was one of the hot venues to play. And I never actually got to play there with my band. But when I was uh, road manager for Edgar Winter, we did a gig at the Action House. And of course, all my friends from Long Island came. And Paul came and we were backstage. And it just so happened that on that particular night, Paul's parents were away for the weekend. Must have been on a Friday or Saturday night. They were away for the weekend. And so <laughs> the band and me and some of our other friends, we went back to Paul's parents' house after the gig. Partied like crazy. I mean, crazy. The house, the front lawn, the back lawn. Crashed there. We all passed out. <laughs> the house was a wreck. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. I, I'll never forget that. Uh, and I'm sure Paul didn't forget it either. We managed to clean up the house before his parents came home. And I don't know if he ever told them or not, but, you know, that was really a funny, a funny experience. And that was Paul. He had his chance and uh, it wasn't for him. That's for sure. Kenny Marshall, another friend from the University of Vermont, was pissed off that I had not chosen him to be in Edgar Winter's road group. Kenny was about five foot seven, slightly built, not athletic in any way. Being a roadie, as I learned, was very demanding, and I knew he would never be able to hack it. Kenny was aware of my concerns, but let me know that at some point he expected a job. He came to visit me at Edgar Winter's house in Clinton Corners, a small town a short distance from New York City in early August of 71. We had a gig not too far away at Gaelic Park in the Bronx. I didn't think it would be a big deal to let him drive Edgar and a couple of guys in the band. I gave him detailed driving directions. Remember, no cell phones, no GPS. And I told him to make sure to leave himself plenty of time. I left early to check out the venue, a medium-sized open-air gig with a good stage and sound system. We were sandwiched between Looking Glass, the opening act, and 10 years after the headliner. The concert was about to begin and no Kenny. Looking Glass had about a 20-minute set. Howard Stein, the promoter, was not happy. Howard Stein was a, was a big deal back in those days. He had Gaelic Park, but his big venue was the Academy of Music on 14th Street. And I don't know if, how many of you were there, but kind of after the Fillmore ended, the Academy of Music took over as being the uh, venue. Yeah, of course, there was Madison Square Garden, but that was on a totally different level. Uh, but Howard's Academy of Music was definitely a hot place to play. And Howard also had the Capitol Theater in Portchester. So he was an important promoter. And, um, you know, it was important for us to do well at Gaelic Park. <laughs> All right. So the concert was about to begin and no Kenny. Looking Glass had about a 20-minute step. Howard Stein, the promoter, was not happy. If Edgar isn't here by the time Looking Glass goes off stage, forget about it. What could I say? Their set ended, and Howard told me, tell the guys to break down Edgar's stuff. I begged for a little more time. Ten minutes, Howard barked back. I was trying to remain calm, but found myself pacing back and forth behind the stage. The ten minutes sped by, and Howard gave the signal for my roadies to move our equipment off stage. At that moment, Kenny's car pulled up and came to a screeching halt, and although he had a curfew... Howard let us do a much shortened set of three songs. I was livid. Kenny did his best to apologize, but I didn't want to hear it. Edgar wouldn't drive back with him. I asked Paul to take him back. 
Kenny loaded out with Ashley and some crew from Gaelic Park. Then, unbeknownst to me, Ashley took off with a girl and told Kenny to drive the 20-foot rented U-Haul truck with all the band's equipment back to the hotel at LaGuardia Airport, where the crew was staying. Kenny had never driven any type of truck before, but for some stupid reason decided to do it anyway. I went back to the house. My anger had subsided. I wasn't quite ready to forgive him, but I had to have some pity, especially when he told me what happened in the car. After having gotten lost once, nobody trusted him, arguments ensued, and they kept going round in circles until Kenny took control again and got them to the gig. About four hours later, I could hear from Kenny's voice. Kenny called. He called. I could hear from his voice that something was wrong. After what he described as an unbelievably harrowing drive, he arrived at the Holiday Inn where the front entrance included a low concrete overhang. The truck was higher than the concrete, and as Kenny drove, he proceeded to peel back the top of the truck as if it were the lid of a sardine can. He was able to back out, but the truck and the concrete awning were badly damaged. Nobody was injured and the equipment was intact. I told Kenny to go home and never call me again. <laughs> Luckily, insurance covered the damage. It was a few years before we spoke, but we still reminisce about it and laugh about it today. Kenny and I are still friendly. He actually lives in Thailand. And uh, we always have a good laugh every now and then about it. That's when I learned about including friends in everything you do certainly has limits. But helping each other is an important part of my friendship and an, uh, an important part of any friendship and an important part of my life. I've been through some extremely difficult times and without the support of friends, I'm not sure how I would have made it. Years later, this philosophy would play a role when Michael Jackson and I became friends and he reached out to me. It wasn't in my nature to turn a friend away, especially when I was in a uniquely qualified position to help. All right, that's it for today. Be careful if you're gonna hire friends, make sure they're capable of doing the job. All right, that's it for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, next week, we will move on. Uh, still a little bit about the music business. Going to tell you a little about my partner, Jim Morris, and about an epiphany I had and how I decided to change careers and whatever. You see, I'm wearing a Woodstock shirt today. This past weekend was the 51st anniversary of the uh, Woodstock uh, Music and Art Fair. And, of course, I've told stories about it and... I had the shirt and I thought I would wear it. So uh, that's that. Have a great week. Catch me somewhere, Facebook, Spotify. Uh, and I'll see you again next week for another reading. And always remember, keep on rocking. Bye.